Know someone who's desperate for peace but looking for it in all the wrong places? Well, chapter 5, verse 1 of the book of Romans tells us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not usually the first place that people look for peace, is it? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us that even the rich, great, and powerful King Nebuchadnezzar came to realize that true peace was ultimately found in God. So grab your Bible, and as you open the book of Daniel at chapter 4, verse 1, Greg Harris is here with us today. Greg, hello. Hey, Steve. And recently in the Through the Bible offices, we heard some great stories of Christians, really normal guys just like you and me, who are finding peace as they stand firm for God in really difficult places. So let's tell our family of listeners about some of them. Yes, Steve. uh, Not only do we get a lot of letters, but uh, we have the privilege of fellowshipping with a lot of different ministry leaders and and ministry workers uh, around the world. And I know you and I have had the privilege of traveling uh, a little bit together. Uh, I remember when we were in Egypt and we met the gentleman who heads the production company that does our television. You remember hearing just some of the sufferings and the challenges he has. Then we were in Jordan with our head of our Arabic ministry department, radio. And uh, we're we're not naming names because some of these people have to suffer varying levels of persecution and difficulty. But but I am thinking of, now you were in Mongolia and you spent some time with uh, Bat Jargal Tufshin Sengal. We just call him Bat. Yeah, you just like Um, to say his name. I do. I can't. It rolls trippingly (laughs) off the tongue. But but you know, Bat Bat has there isn't maybe direct persecution, but you know, Bat has had to pay a price to yeah, live in Mongolia. Yeah, a lot of difficult times, a yeah. lot of pressure. Um, he did an amazing work in terms of building a, a physical radio station and a building, and then really um, being the voice and translator of, of through the Bible and making it the cornerstone of what they do in that part of the world. Yes, and you will remember he told you the story of when their building burned down, uh, right. which was many years ago. I was actually working with him. We were at a meeting. Else were in Asia, and we got word that an electrical fire broke out in the middle of winter and burned the building to the ground. And so, you know, these these kinds of situations are, you know, these are just regular Christians trying to follow Jesus, and they're facing difficulties, and they're finding peace and joy in serving the Lord in, in those difficult places. Yeah. Here's a letter. We also get letters from that mm-hmm. part of the world that are very uh, good to read. So here's one from Ayub, which, by the way, means Job. That's great. Kind of yeah, interesting. That's... And it's in Arabic. I had doubts about the religion I inherited from my family. One time, my friend Osama and I met a man who asked us if we wanted to know about Christianity. Interesting, a guy named Osama wants yes, to know if he wants to know about Christianity. That's not lost on me. Yeah. He then gave us a Bible. Strangely, we were immediately arrested by the local authorities. Over the next few days, we were interrogated about our faith and asked if we interact with other Christians. Eventually, we were released. But my mind raced with questions about my religion and why the need to interrogate and punish others who believe differently. I kept an open mind and started researching more about Jesus. That's when I heard your program. I am now a dedicated listener, and I have become a Christian. Praise the Mm. Lord. I know I will be at risk with the authorities. I only hope I can show grace and mercy when interrogated again. When I asked Jesus into my life, he brought me inner peace, understanding, and pure love. I want to share that with others, and I cannot thank him enough, for he is the best gift a person can have in this life. And Steve, I've heard a lot of letters and a lot of testimonies. This is one of the first where I've heard of a person being persecuted before they became a Christian just because they they had a Bible. And so what an amazing strength of of faith that this man would say, I'll still become a Christian even though I know I'm going to be persecuted. Yeah, also he said, I only hope I can show grace and mercy when interrogated again. It's not if, it's when. he knows when. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our study in Daniel? Heavenly Father, you know the, the people who are being touched by this ministry around the world and how many of them are suffering for their faith and being persecuted. We pray a special blessing and encouragement on many, many listeners of Through the Bible around the world who are suffering and paying that price. We pray that your Holy Spirit will encourage them, strengthen them, and make them great witnesses for you. 
thank you that we get to take your word of encouragement to so many people. We pray you'd continue to do it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we have here in this chapter the dream of Nebuchadnezzar about a great tree hewn down to a stump, and that was fulfilled in the subsequent period of the king's madness. In this chapter, we're going to get a great deal of information that we haven't had before about this man, Nebuchadnezzar. And actually, there was a skeleton in the closet, something I'm sure that they didn't boast of. I'm confident of that. It was the form of insanity that Nebuchadnezzar had. We are coming now to that. And actually... This is just a leaf, as it were, that's taken from the archives of Babylon. And it opens here with the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, because the first four verses here contain the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, and it really should come at the end of the chapter, because this testimony grew out of the experience this man had here in the fourth chapter. Then you have this tree dream of Nebuchadnezzar. That's from verses 4 through 18. And then the tree dream interpreted by Daniel, verses 19 to 27. And then the tragic fulfillment in the mental malady of Nebuchadnezzar, verses 28 through 33. And then we have the time of the dream fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar's reason fully restored and that is verses 34 and 37. Now, this man suffered from a form of insanity that I think is pretty well cataloged today, and a great deal is known about it. And as we are going to suggest, a great many of the world rulers have suffered from this. We're living in a day when a great deal of attention is given to mental illness and to forms of abnormality. And we're living in a day when there's a great deal of it, apparently. Wonder sometimes who is normal in this mad world in which we live. And if you go to the psychologist, you will find out that he draws a little chart. And he puts a line down. And then he begins to draw above that line, just a little above it. Then he goes higher and higher. And then he comes back down. And the bulk of mankind is in this section here where it's higher, and that's called normal. And that that was at the beginning, that is abnormal or below normal, and the other at the other end are above normal. They are where the geniuses are today. Now, that, of course, is arbitrary. Now, who's going to really say today who is sane and who is not sane? The standard is the way all of us act. And when you get the majority, that's called normality. When it's just a few reacting, well, that's called abnormal. But who in the world is going to say that what the majority are doing today is that normal? Is mankind really normal? And that, I think, would be a subject for quite a debate. And I think it would be very difficult to sustain the thesis that we are all normal. Remember when they sent Hamlet in the play of Shakespeare? According to Shakespeare, they sent him from Denmark over to England. And the reason they sent him over there because they thought Hamlet was a little touched in the head. And Shakespeare makes this statement, and of course that was to be played to an English audience, says we send him to England because they're all over there are abnormal. Well, that may apply to the entire human race. I heard this little story some time ago when I was down in Florida about a man that at night he felt like somebody was under his bed and he would get up and look under his bed, satisfy himself at that time that nobody was there. He'd get back in bed and he wouldn't be there five minutes till again he'd feel like somebody's under his bed and he'd have to get out, look under his bed again. Well, he'd do that off and on all night. He's losing his sleep. And this man knew that that was abnormal. And so he decided he better go to a psychiatrist. And he went to a psychiatrist and he told him his problem. 
and the psychiatrist says, well, you really do have a problem. And it's going to be very difficult to bring you back to normal. But he said, I think we can do it. All right. Now he says it'll take 10 sessions and it'll cost you $25 for each session. Well, the man says, I'll have to think that over and I'll let you know. Well, he left, but he didn't come back. Several days went by. In fact, several weeks went by. And one day the psychiatrist met this man on the street. And he said to him, he said, you were the man that had trouble with the man under your bed. And you would have come back to me and you didn't come back. And I just wondered why you didn't. And this man says, well, says I got cured. Well, he says, how did you get cured? Well, he says, I met a carpenter friend of mine after I'd been to your place. I told him what my problem was, that there was somebody under my bed. And so I had to get out and look under that bed a dozen times at night. And he said to me, he said, well, I'll fix that for you. So he came over to my house with a saw, and he sawed off the legs on my bed. And he says, you know, now that fella can't get under the bed. <laughs> May I say to you, I guess a lot of us today have some form of abnormality, you know. But this man, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a problem, and it was a bad problem. Now, first of all, he gives us his testimony, and I want you to listen to it here. And this could have been taken from the archives of Babylon. These are the things that you don't make public, you see. These are things you don't boast of. But here is his testimony. And then you find out why he gave the testimony and the reason back of it. I'm reading now chapter 4 of Daniel, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, friends, this is, I would take it a marvelous testimony, and it shows development. When you move down from chapter 3, and there he issued a decree, and here he gives a real testimony, and it reveals real development. Back in verse 29 of chapter 3, he made a decree at that time, and then he expressed a conviction. Now, here he gives a personal testimony. There it was a decree and here it's a decision. There it was a conviction, and here it's a conversion. He sends a message of peace to all people, nations, and languages of his kingdom. He's not speaking of peace among nations, for he'd already attained such peace by military might, enforced by superior power. Rather, he speaks here of the peace of heart, which comes to a sinner when he knows that he's been accepted of God. It's peace with God. This man's tranquility was restored to him, and we're going to see this as we get into this book here. And he speaks of the fact that what he hath wrought toward me reveals that his testimony is very personal. God is no longer the God of only the three Hebrew children. He then testifies to God's signs, wonders, and dominion. He recognizes and acknowledges that God's rule is above him. God's kingdom is above it. And friends, this is a peace that can only come to the human heart when he knows God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that he made by the blood of the cross. That peace today that comes to a sinner's heart that all's right now because of the penalty that Christ paid and God now is for him and God is on his side. Of all of the trouble today and the travail that is in this world, troubled hearts, back of it all is the sin question. Things are not right. One young fellow said to me, I'm not at peace with myself. 
I'm not at peace with my parents. I'm not at peace with my teachers. I'm not at peace with anybody. And fundamentally, it has to be made peace with God. When there's peace in the human heart, then there can be peace made with those round about us. But until then, men do not know the peace. And I'm not sure today, but what a great deal of abnormality and what is called insanity today could be cured and certainly be helped by bringing the gospel, the knowledge of God to people. I thought how almost absurd it was. They set up these hospitals in the Philippine Islands when the POWs came home, you remember. And they were going to keep them there. They were going to examine them. They were going to give them psychological tests. And these fellows came bounding off of the plane wanting to get to the telephone to call a loved wife or mother or loved one and talk to them. And many of them said that God had been with them. They'd learned to pray and Christ had been with them. And do you know who needed the psychological treatment and who needed the help? It was not these POWs, but it was those poor boys that were the psychiatrists and the doctors who thought these fellows needed a lot of their treatment. And today, people are being taught everything in the world in our schools and colleges, but they put the Word of God out, and there's no peace today. The Word of God can bring peace to the human heart, and that is the problem that this man here had. And when Nebuchadnezzar, made his peace with God, and God had made peace with him. God's already made peace with you, just waiting for you to make peace with him, you see. When that is settled, then, my friend, you don't need to spend so much time on a psychiatrist's couch. You find out that you've got a radiant Christian, and I think that many of these fellows, when they got home and looked around them at our society today, they felt like it was a sick society and that we needed the help and they didn't need the help. And I wonder if some of them might have wondered what was it really they were fighting for over there. Was it to preserve our way of life? Was it to extend it to other people? Our godlessness today and our sin is a nation. What a picture you have. Now we're going to talk about this man and I want you to listen to him now because we're going to find out what his form of insanity is. And we find a symptom of it beginning with verse 4 of chapter 4 of Daniel. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. Now, already we find the personal pronoun my, I, and mine has already been used three times in this one verse. And you'll find it about three times in every verse now in this section here, beginning with verse 4 and going down to about verse 10. Now listen to this. He had a bad case of perpendicular aetis. Remember, Job had that also. Listen to it. Verse 5, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thought upon my bed and the visions upon my head troubled me. It's all about me and mine, you see. And I'm overemphasizing that personal pronoun now. Verse 6, therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I told a dream to them, but they did not make known unto me its interpretation. Verse 8 now, chapter 4, Daniel. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and to him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretations of it. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. 
I saw and beheld a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height of it was great. Now, this is the vision that this man has had. Nebuchadnezzar now is introducing the dream that he's had, and he gives us a surplus of the personal pronoun I. Now, let me say just a word in closing today about this man's form of insanity. I'm of the opinion that the family had kept this quiet. I don't think much had been said about it. And I'm sure that those that were closest to him recognized it. I think that today that the psychiatrist would label it hysteria. Hysteria is a highly emotional mental disease. It's psychosis or psychotic rather than a structural form. It manifests itself in somnambulism, which is sleepwalking, amnesia, loss of memory, and it is thought to be hereditary. And it's quite interesting to note the number of world rulers that have suffered from this type of thing. And let me mention a few. Alexander the Great, he was an alcoholic, by the way, Antiochus Epiphanes, Epimenes, Caesar, Napoleon were subject to epileptic fits, Charles VI of France, Christian VII of Denmark, George III of England, Otho of Bavaria, and one branch of the royal family of Europe. It's been in the Spanish line, in the Russian line, among the czars, and you'll find it in the English line also, I found out that Henry VI, he was a real mad hatter. He suffered from something that was similar to hysteria. Hitler had this same type of thing. And the head of gold here, Nebuchadnezzar, is a lunatic. He has bats in his belfry. He's not ruling with a full hand, I can tell you that. He doesn't have a full deck. This man here, he's just a little off, if you please. Now, it reveals itself, as we've already seen it manifested, in extreme emotionalism in any direction. And we'll find out that he will move either way. Now, the very key to this chapter is verse 17. I want to close with it, and I want you to listen to this. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man, and he giveth it to whomsoever he will, now listen to this, and setteth up over it the basis of man. Now God says that I put on the throne down here the basis of man. In other words, God gives us the kind of rulers we deserve down here and the kind that we want. And there's been many of them that's had bats in his belfry and he's been off his rocker. In fact, any man today, I would think that runs for president, ought to be given a thorough psychological test. See what's wrong with him. Well, why would a man want to do that? May I say to you, the God has said that he sets over it the basis of man. Now, God either meant that or he didn't mean it. He either said it or he didn't say it. But he did say it. And 2,500 years of history since Nebuchadnezzar has surely demonstrated it. And you study the rulers of this world. See if you don't come to the same conclusion. We leave off right there. But next time, friends, we're going to pick up here at the 11th verse of the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The idea that God gives us the kind of rulers we deserve and the kind that we want may be rather difficult to accept, but more important is the truth that it's God who's in control of world affairs, not the leaders of the nations, and that's true today. He's the one who is sovereign and working out his plan for this world. Now, as we believe that God's primary purpose and plan is to redeem people to and for himself through the work of his son, Jesus Christ, that's why our mission is to take God's whole word to the whole world. So as you heard from Greg Harris earlier, this is a team effort here, and we welcome your help as well. 
Have you thought about joining the World Prayer Team, by the way? You should give it a try. The address to sign up is ttb.org forward slash pray, and I can guarantee you'll be glad you did. If you feel God's calling you to financially partner with us in this ministry outreach, then you can also call us today at 1-800-65-BIBLE. That's 1-800-65-BIBLE. Or you can also make a safe donation online at ttb.org forward slash give. Now to all of our prayer warriors and financial partners, thank you for standing with us as God uses through the Bible to get his word out in more than 120 languages and dialects all around the world, including right here at home. Many people ask, what will happen with America in the end times? Well, that's one issue that Dr. McGee will talk about tomorrow as we continue our study in the prophetic book of Daniel. So why don't you join us? I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here on the Bible bus, saving a seat just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.